This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton with Max Blumenthal, and we're continuing here with part two of our discussion with Carrie Ann Mendoza. Carrie Ann is the founder and editor of the British news website, The Canary. That's the canary.co, uh, where they do a lot of pro Jeremy Corbyn reporting and do a lot of reporting on the neoliberals who dominate the parliamentary wing of the Labour Party and, of course, the conservative government led by Prime Minister Theresa May and all of the damage they're doing, the austerity they're imposing, the wars they're propagating, the weapons they're selling to regimes like Saudi Arabia. And in the first part of our episode, we talked about the war that The Guardian and mainstream corporate media outlets have waged on the Canary and on this new independent progressive media. And in this part, we're going to talk about Jeremy Corbyn and how these same neoliberal media outlets like The Guardian have been waging war not just on alternative media, but also on Jeremy Corbyn himself. They've joined with the neoliberals in the Labour Party to try to destroy Jeremy Corbyn, undermine his support, which among the grassroots inside Labour is unprecedented, is, you know, astronomical. He's helped grow the party. Uh, and we're going to talk about how the constant smears against Jeremy Corbyn have come again and again and again, how he's constantly smeared as an anti-Semite for supporting Palestinian rights, how he's tied to so-called extremists, and, and then the most ridiculous smears. I mean, we'll talk about how media outlets have made fun of him for eating beans out of a can. I mean, it's just, it's so outrageous. Uh, but thanks a lot for joining us, Carrie Ann. Yeah, you too. And here are some highlights from our upcoming interview. You know when you get to that point in Monopoly, when like all of the stuff has been bought up and the game gets really dull because you start printing out money just to lend so you can keep going around the board? That is where the UK economy is right now. We need someone to come along and throw everything back in the middle and share it out again. And that, I think, is the role that Corbyn will play, is just is bringing everything back into public ownership that's been privatised. It really will be an extraordinary and exciting period of politics for the United Kingdom if that day comes and, and we're working towards it. There's no reason he shouldn't. The only reason he isn't already the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is because he has the press doing this bidding for him. You know, and obviously right. what we can expect when he does become prime minister is you won't just have the press doing that war. You will probably have the military industrial complex and capital interests take over that war, too. They've had the same basic three or four arguments for now three years. And you can watch it like, like literally we're on Twitter now. People going, oh, oh, OK, it's. Um, a friend of extremists news cycle this week. So they'll trot out the old photos and it's like, never mind that Tony Blair's there shaking hands with the Saudi princes and <laughs> everything. Else. And they're going, that's called pragmatism, Tony. For me, I mean, it's really tiresome, but also kind of upsetting to see Jews constantly used as a human shield by this elite establishment that really, I don't think actually cares about them or real people and the jews that they're working with are you know these these fellow elites who don't really reflect overall jewish opinion and it's really just sad to see it in the uk to see these kind of man this manufactured scandal where a few self-appointed communal leaders speak on behalf of all jews these commentators really couldn't give two hoots about the Jewish community or Jewish individuals at all. I thought these people are so cynical. They will leverage the Holocaust to try and get rid of a grandpa in a cardi on a bicycle who just wants to share stuff. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is nuts. I think the biggest risks for the Conservatives right now is Brexit, that they cannot agree even amongst themselves on a plan for Brexit. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. I see uh, kind of the success of the Canary as part of a larger historical process where 
Um, capitalism is in crisis, uh, in an existential crisis. So people have this phrase, late stage capitalism, but to, I think it's just kind of capitalism uh, running its course. Um, there was this sort of um, process within the Labour Party where Tony Benn, who was the mentor of Jeremy Corbyn, um, the torch was sort of passed to Tony Blair. And this was right after the Cold War when the end of history was proclaimed and Tony Blair comes into office as the sun is rising over him. It's a new era. Um, you know, the, the center will finally hold and prevail. And basically, there's a, there's a ratification of capitalism after the, you know, the wall falls and the Soviet Union collapses and, 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 and Germany pivots towards the West. Everything is pointing towards this axis, this transatlantic axis of Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. And the 90s was really the golden age, I think, of capitalism. Now we're in a totally different phase where... You know, that's all been discredited. Uh, Iraq is in ruins. Much of the Middle East is in ruins, but Syria managed to hold on with Russian help. And this, these, this tra these transatlantic liberals um, centered in London who just faced the Brexit vote don't know what to do, don't really have a clear agenda. They're, as you said, they're not in the factories, they're not in the pubs and in the union halls talking to people about what's going on. And this guy, Jeremy Corbyn, who rides around on a bicycle. A Maoist style bicycle, apparently. Where's cardigans? There, there are articles saying it was a Maoist style bike, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, but he, it, it's so quaint, he rides a bicycle. Just a few years ago, he was hosting Max Blumenthal at Port Cullis House in Westminster to talk about Palestine. You know, he was with the people, uh, is the leader. And so really, The Guardian represents that fading pro-capitalist transatlantic axis that saw its peak during the Tony Blair era. And now, and you have The Canary really representing Corbynism. So there's a, it's basically, I, this is a proxy war in the media. And I want to get, a, we've been talking about the proxy war for the last 45 minutes or so, but let's, let's talk about the bigger picture here. I mean, what, what ha, they've run this campaign on anti-Semitism about Corbyn and they won't stop. Uh, the, it seems like people have just, it's fallen on deaf ears among a lot of people and that it's just an elite narrative, kind of like Russiagate in the US. And they've even tried to import Russiagate into the UK and say Corbyn hangs out with Russian agents from Czechoslovakia and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So, so what happens next? And is he the next prime minister and how does he handle Brexit? Um. I, I think there is every chance he could be the next prime minister. I don't really do kind of, you know, tea leaves and predictions. I want to help make him the next prime minister because our country needs it. You know, we have, it's always to me like, you know, when you get to that point in Monopoly, when like all of the stuff has been bought up and the game gets really dull because you start printing out money just to lend so you can keep going around the board. That is where the UK economy is right now. We need someone to come along and throw everything back in the middle and share it out again. And that, I think, is the role that Corbyn will play, is just is bringing everything back into public ownership that's been privatised. It really will be an extraordinary and exciting period of politics for the United Kingdom if that day comes and, and we're working towards it. There's no reason he shouldn't. The only reason he isn't already the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is because he has the press doing this bidding for him. You know, and right. obviously what we can expect when he does become prime minister is you won't just have the press doing that war. You will probably have the military industrial complex and capital interests take over that war, too. You know, and, and Lord only knows what they're going to try to do to the economy to make it look as if, you know, Corbynism has failed, you know, by attacking right. some key institutions. We've seen this happen all over the world. A very British coup style. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen it so many times in countries, you know, for one of, you know, in Latin America and elsewhere, and certainly in the Middle East, where you have, you know, a socially progressive or socialist, you know, leader come in, and what happens? Capital interests, like, attack that country with everything that they've got. What hasn't happened for a while is, you know, London is the financial centre of the world, you know, it is the home of capital. So, you know, the city of London, I mean, not wider London. You know, the city of London is the home of finance. So what happens <laughs> when the home of capital gets a prime minister? Everything goes to hell. 
So that's what we can expect to see. I don't think there's going to be any change in the playbook. They've got, because the thing is, they've not got competing policies. They know that. They have no policies. They don't even have a candidate. There's no, there's no alternative candidate that they've got that everyone's going, oh, if only that guy or woman was in charge. It doesn't exist. Right. They've got no base. They have no base outside of Islington. So what are they? So they have nothing tangible to kind of take this war to. They've kept flirting with this idea of a, a, sec, a new party. They want to take their little rump of right-wing Labour MPs and create this new progressive party because they are they're arguing now you've got these pundits here that are going i feel politically homeless since corbyn has become leader of labor because i can't vote conservative but i can't vote for corbyn so i'm politically homeless this is the the whining centrist argument that we have well some of the neoliberal blairites have already joined the liberal democrats right that's why the lib dems exist yeah, exactly. The, lib- the liberal Democrats are exactly what they're talking about. And what happened? They've been wiped out. You know, they've got a handful of MPs in Parliament now. If, if, if centrism was such a hot political issue, you would imagine the Liberal Democrats would be the second party right now. Yeah. They believe in these arguments. They're pro-Europe, unashamedly, absolutely pro-Europe. They do return the referendum. And they support all the other stuff that the centrists support. By the way... Uh- some more good news for the Canary. Uh, veteran Lib Dem leader Nick Clegg was just uh, hired as Facebook's head of global operations. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> I could not believe that when I saw it today. I was like, great. So that seems going to be screwing us on the algorithms. Come yeah. Today. <laughs> I don't know anything about algorithms, but just screw the Canary. <laughs> get them off. Just delete, delete. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's nuts. And so, yeah, that's it. So we can, and basically they go through these cycle of rows. It's bizarre. So they've had the same basic three or four arguments for now three years. And you can watch it like, like literally we're on Twitter now. People going, oh, oh, okay. It's um, a friend of extremists news cycle this week. So they'll trot out the old photos and it's like, never mind that Tony Blair's there shaking hands with the Saudi princes and (laughs) everything. And they're going, that's called pragmatism, Tony. Pragmatism. (laughs) You know, Jeremy Corbyn's got a photograph with, you know, a disabled person in a wheelchair who, you know, blocked Regent Street in London. He's an extremist. Yeah. So, yeah. There's the friend of extremists, and then there'll be something about him wearing a cardigan or riding a bike. There's some buffoonery week, you know, it's just like, isn't he just so silly? If we can focus on this for a second, I just want to laugh. There have been so many absurd articles attacking Corbyn for his lifestyle. My personal favorite is that the Daily Mail and a bunch of other rags published an entire article about how Corbin, one of Corbin's wives left him because he was always working and he was always at the office. And apparently <laughs> she was like, yeah, he used to eat cold beans out of a can. That's how low they're scraping the barrel. I remember that. Monster. They were like, he works too hard. He's too committed to his job of helping people. And he eats beans out of a can. <laughs> and then of course, the, the biggest mensch moment ever was when he sat on the floor in the train. But some people tried to spin that as like, It's all PR. You yeah. can't sit on the floor. You pee on. Yeah, yeah Rich, well, they actually said it was a Rich, big PR move. And we were like, you guys are all about PR. What are you suddenly criticizing it for? Like, if Tony Blair pulled off something like that, they'd be like, Man of the people. This man is a, an election guru. He knew how to manage <laughs> those optics. It was amazing. And it's like Jeremy Corbyn's like, there's no way on earth I'm buying a first class to get to sit there when these poor buggers haven't got a seat. And they go, oh, it's awful. Awful. He just uses the media trying to paint himself out as some sort of hero. You're going, what? Yeah, I, I think uh, it was, I don't know if it was The Guardian or who they published an analysis, uh, you know, a, like like a forensic analysis like they do on Syrian chemical attacks to show that there were empty seats. There are seats available. Um, they literally had them circled in red and everything they were like look we've got this still of the cctv and you can clearly see this seat yeah it just uh, the energy you know they're going into to to i mean what is the result of even debunking this story he didn't he ultimately had a very uncomfortable train journey 
I want to share two other smears that are my favorites. All right, here's the Daily Mail article from July 2016. Revealed Jeremy Corbyn's paranoid leadership team plot for hours, blah, blah, blah. While the labor leaders sit silently in meetings munching noodles and granola bars. They wrote an entire article about how in meetings he eats noodles. Wow. <laughs> the lead of the piece is, Jeremy Corbyn's paranoid team waste hours discussing internal labor pots to oust him while the leaders sit silently munching noodles or a granola bar. Former aides have revealed. <laughs> what? I get what a scoop. Well, he's got a balanced diet. I mean, beans are the protein, the noodles, you got carbs. <laughs> and then the final one, the greatest smear of all time was that Jeremy Corbyn is not fit to be prime minister because he refused to name his cat and he just called it El Gato. <laughs> that, was an, that was a real piece. He called his cat El Gato. I can relate. I had uh, two cats I inherited when I moved into an old house once and uh, I called them Cat 1 and <laughs> Cat 2. So I think... You know, honestly, uh, I, I, I was attacked in the Daily, I was used in the Daily Mail to attack Jeremy Corbyn because uh, he had hosted a talk I'd given at, um, as I mentioned, at Port Cullis House was kind of like a cutout of Westminster and, you know, it was an open public talk. And, you know, they said anti-Semite Max Blumenthal, who hates Jews and therefore hates himself and wakes up every morning and like cuts his own wrists because he's Jewish, spoke and um, this is bad and you know, the, he, Holocaust, this and that. I don't know what, it, they just piled everything on. And I went to uh, Jeremy's chief of staff and said, you know, should I write a response to this? Just, you know, straightening this out and showing how many lies are in this piece. And he said, you know, don't even worry about it because nobody pays attention to this crap. The people are basically uh, ignoring this and see it for what it is. And this was back in 2015. And I said, no, you can't, you can't be serious, man. Like the, the, there's just this tidal wave of lies. You've got to respond. And they were right. I mean, they, it was, it was, tr it was true. They basically just stepped back. And I mean, the anti-Semitism one I think was the worst because again, it's like, they try and find it just like our story, you know, with the Nicaragua stuff. It's like, they get to the point where like, we have to somehow make ourselves more progressive than them, even though we don't have a single policy or value which is more progressive than these people. So how can we, and they go, ah, well, they're not really progressive because they're all anti-Semites. They're racists. They're just racist. They're these scary, you know, we're called Nazi stormtroopers. But, you know, it just, it never ends. And this is not, as you say, it's not like the odd article or the odd thing. This is like, the top of the news cycle for weeks and yeah. weeks at a time. And then it will finally die a death. And then, you know, that zombie is coming back from the grave at some point in the near future. So you're just like, it comes to the point where like, there's not even no longer any point in responding to these allegations because they're not fact based. There's no substance to them. And frankly, I don't want to spend the next six weeks constantly having to go through this same process again where you're accused of the same thing you were the last time round <laughs> and prove that it was wrong just to go through because it's the memories of goldfish they don't even care about the fact that they've already accused you of this that there's no substance to the alleg it's just completely made up and they get increasingly hysterical you know to the point where you know you were talking max earlier on about jonathan friedland you know, and some of the articles that he's putting out and the guys at the gu guys and girls at The Guardian, they're like, this is actually hysterical. Oh, I mean, yeah. This, this is unhinged. I mean, warning that Jews will get killed is kind of what it's come to. And uh, we even had, um, we actually managed to have, find a whistleblower inside the Jewish News, which was one of the three Jewish weeklies that published this joint headline earlier this year, which was, said, United We Stand. Jeremy Corbyn is an existential threat to Jewish life in Britain. They're literally saying that if this man becomes prime minister, Jewish people are going to be killed in the streets, wheeled off. I mean, it was the most disgusting. I mean, I was offended on about every level that a human being can be offended. You know, it's untrue. It's an awful abuse of a very real and disgusting crime, you know, namely the Holocaust. And and they would they were literally leveraging. I thought these people are so cynical. They will leverage the Holocaust 
to try and get rid of a grandpa in a cardi on a bicycle who just wants to share stuff. I mean, this is <laughs> this is nuts. So we were kind of going doing the normal rounds of rebutting those stories, and then I was contacted by an editor inside the Jewish News who um, said, "Look, I really need to speak out. I'm so, I'm absolutely disgusted about." this decision and not just the decision itself, but I know how this decision was made. I know the people that are making these decisions. They're not even in this country, you know, and this, this is a concerted smear campaign. They're openly discussing it in the office as a smear campaign. They're not even claiming amongst themselves in the office that they're doing this out of a genuine fear for the Jewish community. So he wanted to speak out and, we went to publish and all hell broke loose behind the scenes. We had all sorts of threats about exactly how badly they were going to do us over if we tried to publish this piece. And we managed to get some legal support in place and we went, well, do it. We're publishing it. And we ran it. And silence. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> silence. It was just like when BuzzFeed updated their story about Max it's like the moment that the story is proven false, they just, they don't correct, retract, you know, nothing. So, and you're like, hang on a minute. They have literally been talking about this story 24 hours a day. It's the leading item on every news program. And an editor at that paper comes forward and says, by the way, this is a concerted smear campaign and a bunch of confected outrage. And no one picks it up. You know, it's just blacklisted. The story's like, it never happened. They move on to the next smear. They always do that. Yeah, and then on to... And it was, yeah, they do. And they just, the cart rolls on. And then that was about the end of that period. So they just went, okay, guys, drop the campaign for a bit. Drop it. <laughs> and, and suddenly, eat. it just... Never mind the fact that it's been hysterical for weeks. Suddenly, one morning, gone. The story is not being discussed anymore. And you can bet your bottom dollar. I mean, Tony Blair's been out... This week, I saw a story in The Guardian, again, with Tony Blair saying, oh, the Labour leadership is not taking the concerns of Jewish people seriously. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Tony's off again. The Guardian's off again. So I'd probably give you about 10 days until we're in another one of these extended um, cycles. It's just, I mean, it's... I would just say, you know, for me, I mean, it's really tiresome, but also kind of upsetting to see Jews constantly used as a human shield by this elite establishment that really, I don't think actually cares about them or real people. And the Jews that they're working with are, you know, these, these fellow elites who don't really reflect overall Jewish opinion in the UK or elsewhere. Um, but they're these self-appointed communal leaders because they're the ones who have access to the donor class and to the uh, you know the powerful people in Whitehall and elsewhere. So you know that's the dynamic we've been facing in the U.S. Those of us who are you know advocating for you know the the basic existence of Palestinians, um, and it's really just sad to see it in the U.K. to see these kind of man this manufactured scandal where a few self-appointed communal leaders speak on behalf of all Jews and you know to be and the, the the then there's a fear factor there and I think that they almost are seeking to you know they, they're creating this specter of anti-semitism to the point where it almost seems like they want it to exist yeah. and to the extent that they link themselves to these elite uh, interests that everybody despises and claim to speak on behalf of all Jews uh, while so many uh, Jewish people I know in the UK are out there, uh, you know, protesting against uh, Israel's wars or joining up and organizing for Corbyn, while they're doing that, they're kind of implicating Jews. And I, I, I mean, I think that when you look at groups like Judas, which had um, Shabbat dinner with Jeremy Corbyn, what they're trying to say is, you know, you don't get to represent us and use us as a human shield anymore. And then he was attacked for that, for having Shabbat with a bunch of Jews who just don't reflect what the Jewish news editorial board wants everybody to think. Yeah, it's completely right. And I mean, this stuff, there were several incidents recently that have kind of underscored this issue. So the first point you made about the fact that these commentators really couldn't give two hoots about 
the Jewish community or Jewish individuals at all. Is for me exemplified in the tweet by Dan Hodges, where a, a prominent Jewish blogger in this country tweets Dan Hodges and says, hey, can you please stop using my religion as a political football, please? And Dan Hodges responds, you be Corbyn's useful Jewish idiot if you want to. Dan Hodges is not Jewish. Yeah. Where does he get off saying that? Calling a Jewish person a useful Jewish idiot while proclaiming himself the white saviour of Jewish people in this country. You couldn't make it up. Then a couple of weeks ago, at the Labour, I was at the Labour conference and I was giving a speech somewhere else on the fringe. And, um, and Jackie Walker, who is a, a Jewish black woman, prominent in the Labour Party, you guys have probably heard about her. She's basically been tarred as an anti-Semite and chucked you know, into the bull rushes. And she's put together this film called The Political Lynching of Jackie Walker. That was on that night. And I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go across, show some support. On the way there, I hear there's been a bomb threat. Two bomb threats, right? Yeah. On, on this movie... <laughs> so, so um, and it's been called in. I've spoken to the police. I've spoken to the organisers, and the fact that this was a Jewish event was mentioned in the call. So this, you know, this was really dirty stuff. And I've seen Max's event in Manchester a little while ago, where you had the Israeli guys outside, you know, picketing you. Well, I actually was physically, I was physically, I wouldn't say assaulted in Manchester, but I was pushed. A guy tried to physically prevent me from entering my own event at a Quaker meeting hall. These are the same people that are like on the front lines of this campaign against Jeremy Corbyn. You had this woman, Mandy Blumenthal, who I have no relation to, who was just following me around the country, just hounding me. They were doing protests outside my book events where I just wanted to talk about the war on Gaza in 2014. They were blowing trumpets, waving Israeli flags. And she was on, I saw her on Sky News as a former Labour supporter who can no longer support Jeremy Corbyn because of the anti-Semitism. Please, this she is working with Friends of Sussex and like the EDL and the most right-wing elements in the country. Also, like, she'd already, because she did that on Corbyn as well. <laughs> she'd actually left the party. This, um, oh, her name's gone. The celebrity. She actually looks identical to my mother-in-law. It's really funny. She doesn't, she doesn't like that comparison anymore. <laughs> my mother-in-law is Jewish also, I should say. <laughs> and, and, uh, but yeah, she's Maureen Lippmann. So it's Maureen yeah. Lippmann. And she's now, when Corbyn came along, she got behind this whole anti-Semitism where I was like, yes, I speak for Jews. We're all even. I used to vote Labour, can't vote Labour under Corbyn. There's literally, this is a new news cycle that she'd already done in 2015 when Ed right. Miliband was leader. After the vote that recognised the state Palestine. of Palestine, she did the exact, and no one, no, she was on all of the BBC News, Newsnight, everything else. Not one of those amazing journalists said to her, hey Maureen, didn't you literally already leave the Labour Party? Not one of them brought up the fact that she'd already left and done a whole bunch of media about it. And that's when you know that they, these are not people that are reporting facts. They're not actually analysing the story, analysing what different sources are telling them and trying to come to a place of truth. You know, And if the truth is impossible, kind of a balancing act. This is just the parroting of accusations that are convenient for a narrative that the establishment wants to run. And anything from any source which competes with that is just either ignored or it's lied about. It's misrepresented in some way, whether it's a Jewish person saying it, a black person saying it, well, it doesn't matter what the source is. Yeah, there's there's no there's no shame. I mean, as you point out, uh, or a black Jewish person like like Jackie Walker has been just completely destroyed by this. I wouldn't say destroyed because she's still out fighting, but she's I mean, a tough cookie. But they've really had a good go at destroying her. I mean, it's been, di I mean, a disgraceful campaign. And that was that was the end of that point. Was that you know you've got a bomb threat at a Jewish, a black Jewish woman's event. I mean, literally, it, you know, if a Jewish person at the moment sort of scrapes their knee and they happen to be a centrist, Corbyn did it. You know? yeah. And you've now got a bomb threat. You've got an actual credible incident. And it, no one covered it. And then The Guardian picked it. I actually covered it because I was there. I published a piece of The Canary. The Guardian ran the story the next day. They didn't run a picture of Jackie Walker. 
The headline said, Jewish event at Labour conference receives bomb threat. Oh, my God. Right. They ran a picture that was a, a centrist event inside the venue. So if you hadn't bothered to read the article and the details, you would think that some crazy Labour people like tried to attack a Jewish event at the court. I mean, it just, it really is, for, you know, as a human being and as a journalist, it is just so upsetting to see people do this because you, you know they're arch propagandists. This is rank. This is the worst kind of propaganda and censorship that's taking place. And all the while they're patting themselves on the back and calling themselves the gatekeepers of truth. Well, it, it really exemplifies the Malcolm X quote, that the media will have you believing that the... The villain is the victim and the victim is the villain. I mean, there's just that right there where Absolutely. a black Jewish woman who is falsely smeared as anti-Semitic gets bomb threats, two bomb threats at her film showing, yeah. and then they portray that as the supposed anti-Semitism that she represents, not that she's actually a victim of. It's just so, it's so mind-boggling. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a quick question. So right now, Theresa May has a very thin but... Perhaps she has some kind of electoral mandate to stay in power until 2022. Uh, however, it, of course, I don't think she would like to call a snap election, but her her governing coalition is very unstable. Uh, Boris Johnson has stepped down. Um, other prominent members uh, have either stepped down or there are rumors they might. It seems like she's barely holding on. Do you think that the Tories will be able to stay in power until 2022? Um, and even if they do, uh, do you think that in the next few years, we, even if it's 2022 at the latest, we could see Labour actually form a government with Jeremy Corbyn as prime minister? I'm just curious what you think the path to that could be. I, I know you, I don't want you to, to try to predict the future, but if there is a snap election, how could that happen? I think the biggest risks for the Conservatives right now is Brexit, that they cannot agree even amongst themselves on a plan for Brexit. It's not like they are all on one team and then they're having trouble in Europe trying to sell this plan um, to European leaders. They are divided amongst themselves. You've got what they call one nation Conservatives um, who maybe are kind of more remainers. They like the status quo. Um, you know, why would we break up a neoliberal free trade area? Why would you, know, why would you do this? Um, and then you've got kind of the hard, hard right of the party, which, um, you know, is like, well, we'll just set up other free trade agreements. You know, but while we're doing it, we can also cut health and safety legislation. We can cut food safety legislation. We can get rid of all of this annoying red tape that, by the way, is keeping animals, people and planet safe. Um, in this part of the world oh and while we're doing it we can also have a bonfire of civil liberties and working people's rights that's what we really want to go for so that's called hard brexit is this kind of absolute bonfire of everything you've tried to create over the last few well not the last few the last few decades they've been trying to dismantle it but you know the core of kind of what's left over of socialist britain um they want to get rid of that with brexit that's their kind of aim so, and they're at, in a pitched war right now. Like, it's really ugly. You know, literally Jonathan Mercer, a guy, senior toy today, came out and was just like, he literally called his government a, quote, shit show. In public. In the middle of negotiations with the EU. So, it's really shambolic. Um, the EU is also, of course, really keenly in favour of Britain staying. It's quite embarrassing to have you know, Britain leave. So I think there's lots of possible ways that Europe, I think, would do everything it could to prevent a vote for us to remain, but will ultimately, you know, kind of make a deal if we really Brexit. And that's what we're seeing play out now. You know, Europe doesn't want their economy harmed either. So I think the kind of apocalyptic warnings around Brexit are probably not going to come to much at the end of the day. Um, but nevertheless, we've got to go through this news cycle for the next couple of months. Now, what Labour have done throughout this period is essentially stood back and said, let's just let them hoist themselves by their own petard. You know, they're doing a perfectly adequate job of being deeply embarrassing and unpopular right now. Like, let's not muddy the waters by having people feel like this is party political. Let's make it that they are incompetent. Um, 
and that's where they are. And there's a sort of frustration, I think, sort of the Paul Mason types, others who are maybe soft Brexiters or reluctant Remainers going, you know, they want to see Labour being fiercer um, on the topic. They want to kind of see more polemics. The centrists want, you know, Labour to be the party of Remain, you know, even though it was, it lost. <laughs> the clue is there. Um so it's a difficult time. I actually think Jeremy Corbyn and his team have played a blinder on Brexit, which is we'll honour the referendum, but there's no way on earth we're going to accept a hard Brexit deal. I'm content with that. I voted Remain and I am content with that. You know, if we have a left wing Brexit, OK, you know, c- can live with that. You know, not a fan of it, but can live with it. So I think most people who are an, an extreme Remainer or an extreme Brexiteer are kind of pretty much OK with where Labour are at at the moment. But if you are an extreme Remainer, you hate Jeremy Corbyn right now. In fact, you know, the Guardian's push is Jeremy Corbyn created Brexit. That's right. literally their line. Jeremy Corbyn is responsible for Brexit. That, that narrative started from the beginning. and he secretly voted Brexit. He secretly wants it. It's just... Ugh. And then on the on the other side, you have kind of the negation of uh, British democracy and you know full embrace of the EU, which helped create this whole crisis in the first place. So, it's it there. There's no real good choice here. There's not, and like they say, oh, but the thing is, there's the rise of the far right that's associated with Brexit. Well, Hungary has an anti-Semitic fascist government, and the EU's doing absolutely nothing about it. Now, and they go, well, it will hamper our efforts to help refugees. And Poland too. Not being funny, Europe's building giant fences to keep refugees out right now while boats are sinking in the sea. So, you know, oh, well, our economy will hurt. Well, take a look at Greece and Spain and Portugal and come back and tell me that the EU is not also capable of decimating economies when it chooses to do so. So there are, you know, there are legitimate reasons to be concerned about staying in the EU, which are not about racism and and anti-immigrant sentiment. But, you know, so, you know, what are the chances of a Corbyn government? Well, Labour are, prepa- are literally on an election platform now, permanently. They're just saying we're permanently on an election footing. It could happen next week. But it could also not happen till 2022. And so as a kind of media outlet, we're in the same cycle. We're like, this has been the same news cycle for three years and we're not even going to be out of it. You know, until Brexit is done and until Theresa May is gone. You know, so I think journalists and politicians and voters alike are kind of like, come, please, can this government implode now so that we can get a mandate for something else? You know, because I cannot, I wouldn't, I can't believe Theresa May would win another election right now. She's so manifestly cocking up this entire process. It's hard to imagine that she'd win the support. So she probably wouldn't be the candidate, which leaves you with who? Like, Boris? <laughs> Prime yeah, Minister yeah. Boris Johnson. Michael Gove. <laughs> they re- and they really struggle because they've got no unifying candidate. So they've got Boris, who until recently might have done fairly well at a ballot box, but the party hates him. <laughs> they really hate him. So unlikely to get there. And then you've got someone like Michael Gove, who actually is held in great esteem in the party. They think he's this, you know, kind of very smart, capable guy, but the public hate him. He's so appealing. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys are aware of Pob, but there was like this little cartoon where we're a little program where we're kids called Pob and Michael Gove looks identical to his character in Pob, which is deeply unfortunate because basically if you're 30 or up, you just can't take the guy seriously. <laughs> but <laughs> But he, you know, and and then you look around, you go, there's no, there's not a deep bench there right now in the Conservatives. It's really difficult to see, you know, because the party is on civil war over Europe again. You know that the party's only going to vote for a Brexiteer, and a Brexit, and the only Brexiteers they've got left now are extreme Brexiteers. So all of them are going to face the same issues going out to the public because they are going to be seen as. The, as true right-wing Tories. They're not even compassionate, compassionate conservatives anymore, whatever that means. You know, Labour again, you know, I think the bench needs to deepen too, actually. I think this movement can't just hang off Jeremy Corbyn. I think he has done a, it doing and continues to do 
an incredible job of actually, you know, it's all the stuff that, that's behind the scenes that people don't see. The way that he's, him and his team were transforming the party itself, you know, to be to be more democratic, to really make the party a left wing party, regardless of who's leading it. And that's been really exciting. So I'm I'm kind of keen to see well who are going to be kind of the heirs to Jeremy Corbyn on the left now of the, of the Labour Party because if we're looking five, ten, fifteen years, it cannot still be Corbyn. Right. You know, his number two McDonald is the same age, so they're both going into kind of retirement age at this point. So it's really you know, and and there is a massively diverse team behind them. There are a lot of women, a lot of black women, a lot of black. That is is a really great team. So it could be really exciting, I think, in the, you know, five, ten years to see, you know, a kind of a whole front bench all at the same talent level, you know, really knocking it out of the park. And, you know, so I would like them to get in while Corbyn is still leading it because he is just steady as a rock. And you're going to need that. You're going to need that calm, seasoned guy who's seen it all before and can weather apparently any storm because he has had everything in the kitchen sinks thrown at him over the last yeah. couple of years and not buckled once. So I think having him for that initial period is, is not only kind of something you'd want, but actually necessary and, you know, working with the rest of the talent in the front bench to get them to a point where they're not only, you know, sufficiently briefed on their topics, you know, and, and experts in their field, but they've also built that fortitude that you're going to need to actually lead that movement when it's going up against capital, <laughs> Yeah, you because know, you know we were uh, there's a great event at the Labour conference, you know, where they were saying turning a movement into government. And it's like whatever we have seen up until this point is the tip of the iceberg compared to what you need to be ready for if we win government. It'll be a full on regime. It'll be a full on regime change operation, kind of uh, much more actually. I would say more extreme than what we've seen in the US against Donald Trump, who is on the side of capital and has managed to kind of co-opt or been co-opted by the military industrial complex. Uh, Corbyn, you know, that's not going to happen with him. But, you know, it is encouraging um, what, you, what you've pointed out, which is that he's weathered so many storms, I think more storms than I've seen most politicians, especially those outside power without the what we call the bully pulpit, uh, be able to withstand. So, I mean, I think uh, it, it, it is, it's encouraging and, and the future is encouraging because Labour has been able to expand its membership roles so much and really start to reflect more of the public, which inevitably means that it's going to trend left. So maybe on that uh, hopeful note, we can close, uh, Ben. Yeah, actually, really quickly, Carrie ann I was just going to ask you to, to um, close up here. I was, I was curious, reading your bio... You were previously a former management consultant in banking. I was, yeah. And uh, according to your bio, you left your job to join the Occupy movement. So I'm wondering, you know, concluding here, maybe you could talk about what brings you to left-wing politics and why you left a, a well-paying job uh, as a management consultant. <laughs> um, I think for me, I kind of, I've, I've kind of gone right, left, Right, and then back to left again in kind of my adulthood. I, I totally got into Blairism at the time. I, I was sold on Blairism. I'm like, this is amazing. So you can speak authoritatively from prior experience. You know neoliberalism. You were one. Totally. It's like, you know, they characterise it. You know, they characterise it as like extremists. It's like, no, I, to you know, I totally went with this Blairism thing. And then I went, to, I t did my first trip to Palestine in 2002 and was like oh and this was around the time that like Blair had literally just sold a bunch of like Hawk jets to Israel that was all going on and and I just saw what I saw on that for because Israel had actually invaded this is during the second intifada and so we ended up in Ramallah when it was under siege by Israel and kind of all these bombs were going off and everything else turned on the BBC news because we were like this has got to be on the news and um and the BBC reporter said well it's a quiet night in Ramallah Israeli forces have withdrawn and we're there and literally there were Apache helicopters in the sky, there were tanks barreling down the streets, shit was exploding all over the place. And I'm like, if I was home now and I even cared enough to watch the news to find out what was going on in Israel-Palestine, I would not only have been uninformed, I'd have been misinformed. And that really made me quite angry. Um, 
But then I kind of, that anger kind of undealt with can turn to resignation pretty quickly. And I just got resigned after a couple of years. I was like, this is a useless battle. The world's never going to change. There's no point in doing anything. I'm just going to go off and set my own life up. That's what I'll do. So I did. I went off and became a management consultant. But while I was a management consultant, I ended up working in the NHS and working in local government on major infrastructure projects and on these, you know, lean um, projects to kind of basically sack people and, um, and privatise as much as possible. And I'm inside, you know, the banks and then local government and then everything else. And I'm going, oh, my God, this is awful. This is, this is corruption. This is absolutely disgusting. And I was completely fell out of love with it. Then the financial crisis happened and no one was held to account. And that's when I joined the Occupy movement. And it was just being a part of Occupy where I just kind of got reacquainted with it doesn't matter if you don't change all of this in your lifetime. Like stop getting so attached to like almost my own version of the white savior complex. It's like if I can't fix this tomorrow, I'm not going to be involved in it. And going, actually, someone has to step up. You know, someone now has to do something. And that can be me and it can be you and it can be Max and all of these other people making these little decisions to stand up. And soon enough, you look around and there are millions of you. And then you can start organizing and then you can start effecting change. That was what the Occupy movement did for me. It just reminded me that it's not about your own ego. It's not about what you personally may or may not achieve in the course of your lifetime. It's about connecting with people and about fulfilling a basic promise, which is I want to do everything I can to leave this world in a better place than I found it. And you can only do that in a team. And Occupy was my first team, you know, and the Canary has become another team. Um, and, you know, you guys are a team you know, in the stuff that you do. And I think that's, that for me is the great opportunity about what we do is it's just, you know, I felt for a really long time, we're all, you know, kind of say this a lot, but, you know, we're looking over our shoulders for like the, the whole noughties of like, when is the cavalry coming? Let's get us sort this out. It really looks like the world is going to shit right now. Like who's going to come and fix it? And then you suddenly realize, oh, we're the cavalry. Like we're it. We're the people that are here right now. So it's on us to get involved. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, it's a great note to end on. And I will say it's a privilege to be part of the same team as you. You in the UK are doing amazing work at the Canary. Thank you. Ditto. Hopefully in the US we can have our own Jeremy Corbyn. Let's ride. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot. We were speaking with Carrie Ann Mendoza, who is the editor in chief and founder of The Canary. You can find uh, Carrie Ann on Twitter at The Mendoza Woman, and you can find The Canary at thecanary.co. Thanks a lot. And we are at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Yeah, you can support us there and help us to continue doing this show. Thanks a lot for listening and for those watching. Thanks for watching. This is Moderate Rebels.